Buddy Rich said, Rick Stepton is the best lead trombonist I've ever had in my band. Rick has toured with the orchestras of Buddy Rich, Woody Herman, Lee Castle, Jimmy Dorsey, Artie Shaw, Chuck Mangione, and Maynard Ferguson. He recently played with the Greg Hopkins Jazz Orchestra and the Mark Marquis Group for the Farm Fresh Jazz Festival featuring Tom Harrell at Hollis Hills Farm on the 4th of July this year. He has performed in practically every U.S. state and in Canada, Mexico, Europe, South America, and the Far East. Rick has recorded with Buddy Rich, Woody Herman, Orange Then Blue, and Gunther Schuller. He's appeared on the Johnny Carson and Ed Sullivan television shows and has made several appearances on BBC TV and Jazz Radio Canada. We went up to uh, Davis Street and uh, Simon Street. I couldn't remember which house was his. Well, it's right on the corner of Davis and Simon. It's the one that sits right on, right it's in a, that. It's a little house? It's a little, it, it's a little single family house. It's not at all surrounded by triple deckers. When we were in the, uh, in the eighth grade, the Ifbra, and uh, one day, for some reason, Ricky and I found ourselves outside the door waiting to see our guidance teacher, Lyman Sleeper. He had a series of facial tics. His face was always in motion. He had big white eyebrows. They were like caterpillars. He kind of crawled on his, uh, on his face. He had these jowls. And the most amazing thing about him was he was deaf as a post. And he had an old-fashioned hearing aid. It was a large button in his ear. And he had a little box here. And it was about the, the size of, you know, of a Walkman. and knobs on it. And when he talked to you, he was always adjusting these knobs to try to tune you in. He was the first one to go in, and uh, he didn't really remember, uh, know any of us by name, so he asked me my name, obvious thing to, uh, to do. And at that time in my life, I stuttered badly. And one of the things that people who stutter get caught on very often is simply saying their name. So I'm standing there, and... Uh, this is Sleeper. He's like, all right, young man, who are you? What's, what's your name? And my mouth is opening and closing, but no sound was coming out. And I simply could not say, I'm Bill Joyner. And Mr. Sleeper, of course, thought there was something wrong with his hearing aid. So he's adjusting these knobs, and his eyebrows are crawling like, like this, and I'm panicking, and nothing is coming out of my mouth. And Ricky is standing behind me, and immediately, he knew me, and he knew my affliction. And uh, he had, uh, with great presence of mind, and and very gallantly he stepped around and introduced me to Live and Sleeper. He said, Mr. Sleeper, this is my friend Bill Joyner. And uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Sleeper heard that and it solved the problem beautifully. But I was, I was so worked up and upset at this point that my response was to get mad at Ricky. <laughs> I looked at him and I said, Rick, I know my name. And, and Ricky simply said, you know, he was taking it back. And Ricky said, you know, well, sometimes you have a little trouble getting it out. <laughs> <laughs> it was very characteristic of, of, of Rick. It was a kind gesture that uh, uh, kids don't usually, most kids don't show to each other. Rick would, you know, uh, most kids would simply you know, seeing me would just delight in letting me hang there and suffer, you know, and turn in the wind. Let me start down with the cute little house. It is. All the dangerous thoughts were first nurtured up there. The President of the United States should be, should have a PhD in ecology. And if they knew that, they wouldn't need to know anything else. Because if you have a PhD in ecology, you know the one word that is important in life, and that's symbiosis. And the fact that we're all in this together, there's no way you can go wrong if you know that you're entitled to everything I'm entitled to just by the fact that you were born. You know, and if I deny you one little thing, I take a chance of you stealing my car. I ain't gonna deny you that. You know? the key, and, and being yourself and knowing, finding a role for yourself in life and knowing what that role is and sticking to it. I don't go into other people's backyards and take money away from them. I either having too many jobs or too many kids or too many bad habits or too many stupid desires. I don't have have those goals so that I would go out there and try to make more money 
than the next person because I need more money and therefore I'm creating less money for that person that might ultimately steal my car or kill my kids or rape my wife. I'm not exactly sure uh, when I wrote it, but when I write my compositions, I usually write them on my trombone. I'll be practicing and I'll just all of a sudden get this inspiration to play a melody. And <clears throat> this one came out and it just sounded to me like Buddy Rich. And it was uh, just my tribute to him. You, you might get a buzz from caffeine and have, get, get that happy little endorphin popping and, and, and write, a, write a tune like da ba doo da ba doo da da ba da da ba da da do da And it just sounds like Buddy Rich. And most of my songs were written that way while I was uh, playing. And I would just be tooling around, you know, ba doo ba doo ba doo ba doo And all of a sudden I go, ba ba doo da 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 ba I think I'll keep on going, da ba doo da, you know. And sometimes it came out all the way, sometimes it went into the drawer. I worked with him many, many different times. I joined him in May. 1968, and the last time I worked with him was in uh, January of 1986. And I worked with him off and on through the years. The biggest uh, run was two and a half years when I first joined him. night I joined Buddy Rich's band I thought I was inside the uh, back end of an airplane and it was nothing but extreme it was like like this huge ball, sitting inside a huge ball of energy like almost in an electric chair kind of kind of feeling only not death life you know it was a uh, it, it, it's just very hard to explain uh, when you have like several musicians that are there for the same reason playing at the peak of their ability or at least making the attempt and the band leaders were all virtuosos and it, it, it was just an amazing experience it was very tough being on the road was extremely tough and i defy anybody to do 500 miles a night after the job and sit there like a choir boy and that's when the party had usually happened on the bus and then everybody would pass out <laughs> and wake up in the next town and do it all over again. So you knew that for about 15 years and you got some chromosome problems. You know? But thankfully we have enough to go around. For himself. He was sort of like a Sammy Davis Jr., except his voice was not. His voice was good. He made some singing albums when he had a series of heart attacks and he tried to make it as a singer. He, he was extremely talented. He, he, he supported his family from the time he was three years old. Wow. So he loved dancing. You know? I come from a family of trombones. I always say that it's like slide in the family bone. And, uh, we played with a lot of the union. Unions were big in those days, and they had town bands. Town bands were all the rage, like with Sousa type bands. And there were like three in the area that were union the Ashby Band, the Fitchburg Band, and the Lemonster Band, which was called the Italian Colonia Band. I believe that is the oldest of the local bands. There is still a town band in Lunenburg, but it's non union. 
There's one in Concord that's non-union. There's one in Townsend that's non-union. And it's still going on, but as a, as a way of, 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 as an entertainment, it's no longer, or it's really fading out. In, in those days, they used to, we used to do band concerts like, like three, four nights a week. People would, would sit in their cars and eat popcorn and drink soda and beep their horns after every Sousa march. And uh, it was a great, great way to, to learn how to play because, the, you know, the rhythm of the march and, and we talked about this earlier, the heartbeat, it's all coordinated, you know, like the heartbeat is, is almost like, a, like a, at, at a quarter note equals 60, uh, which is like, you know, one, two, and then a march is just double that. Da, 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 da. So it, it, it's very lively and maybe that's where a lot of rhythm started happening early in, in, in life was... Uh, was through through the ritual of, of of metered marching or metered you know dancing, and, and I I always uh, mentioned to uh, students of mine that I developed my peripheral vision by uh, ma marching in parades and, and and dodging the droppings from the horses when they, when they were in, in front of the band, and uh, of course we played trios and duos and solos and it was tremendous. They had sing-alongs and. In those days, uh, right up probably until the 70s, it was still pretty vibrant, you know, and uh, now it's sort of like uh, a lost art, if you will, the, uh, the town band where, where the community went out and, you know, kids and all, and they all liked the same music and beeped their horns and applauded and hung out, and I could still smell the popcorn coming, coming off the, the cart in Ashby. And they used to have the, the church dinners and the bean suppers and geez it was it was a great time and and that was my first those were my first professional gigs and you talk about influences I, I I think they were a tremendous influence I basically would have stayed with him forever if I'd have known how much he liked me but I had many uh, stage fright and uh, inferiority complex issues and I figured I'd always leave him before he fired me but he was always asking me back, and then in, in later years I found out how much he admired me, and if I had known that, I would have stayed with him for the, for, you know, it would have ended up being 18 years. The gigs were always better with Buddy. He played the better gigs, but, you know, his uh, temper was legendary, and he never yelled at me, but it's not easy to see people being yelled at all the time, and... Uh, you know, it's kind of puts you under pressure. I don't know why he had the temper he did, probably because he was abused as a child and had to make a living for his family from the time he was three years old. And his friends were all becoming stars like Frank Sinatra, and just because Buddy played drums, he wasn't as famous as Frank, but he certainly could play the drums uh, as well as Frank could sing, if not better. But that's the way it goes. Vocalists are more popular. And, you know, maybe Frank was a little bit better looking. Who knows? I'm not going to say it again. Ben, better stay outside. I'm not going to tell you again. I was in awe of his professionalism and his his solo ability and it j just you know he's he's one of a kind and and to be part of that is is something special and I never people always ask me how how I was playing with buddy I I guess I've always had a sense of individuality and which if you really think about it 
you know, demands uh, self-discipline. If you're not going to be uh, getting yourself fired everywhere you go by being different, you've got to toe the line in some kind of ways. And I, I, it seems to me I knew what he, what he wanted. He, he, uh, he just wanted you to sit there and take care of business. When he said bow, you got up and bowed. Uh, you paid attention to him without staring at him. Uh, you just put as much into your music as he put into his. And it was sort of like a combination. But I, I think the self-discipline part, I always knew what was expected of me, no matter what band I went on. But I would never be uh, obsequious or I would never acquiesce to... Uh, subservience. I always had to be myself. He just lived for music, so I was happy for him in that regard. Hi, I'm B, and Rick is my son. Started playing trombone when he was eight years old at the persuasion of his grandfather, I'm sure, who was his teacher. And I remember thinking when he when he uh, first started playing, and I said, how's he he can't reach the end of the slide. How's he going to reach those notes? And that bothered me because he was so small. So I remember when he was in high school, he had this little band with uh, neighborhood boys. It was, it was uh, the Hooper boy and the uh, Healy boy. And that they would practice Moon River forever and a day in my kitchen. I didn't care if I ever heard that song again. But the sun rose setting in him and Masha would get it. And Masha was, and I got along great. She didn't hold that against me. She got involved in uh, in dancing, and, and she got involved in rock and roll, and, and 45s, and teeny bopper stuff, and, and I was into music. So our careers were, were at variance even then. The remarkable thing is, is we had a great childhood together, mm -hmm. with a lot of mutual respect. He had twin beds, and uh, He'd go to bed at night, and he'd lay out all his clothes for the next day on the other twin bed. All laid out like this. <laughs> He's a clutter enough. We were financially challenged. We got presents on birthdays and Christmas only, but there wasn't a bit of unhappiness in that family at all. It was like nothing but a great memory. I went into the army. And then things changed, but even then, until Dad started drinking a lot, it was, it's always been a very loving family. The uh, business and professional women, or, or uh, BPW as it's called, um, is a national organization. And um, I became a member of in Lemonster. And shortly after I became a member, I really got enthused with it. and. Um, I became local president and eventually state president of it. And uh, I, I, I think it, that being in BBW made me grow a lot because I, I met so many interesting women in different fields and uh, I would go to conventions and I would meet more people there in all the different states. And it made me grow uh, as a person. They had political seminars and they had uh, different, oh, how can I say it, they had foundations, it was a typical uh, organization for people who were in business or uh, professional life. We went down to Lenny's on a turnpike in Peabody, at jazz club there, and uh, Buddy Rich was playing there and Rick had to sit in, and uh, that was when he was hired, he sat in, I remember this tune he played was Mercy Mercy and uh, I was so proud of course Rick's always been excellent at sight reading so I wasn't afraid that he couldn't read the music sight unseen because he was always very good at that. I joined the band after after the gig at a rehearsal that started after midnight and Phil Wilson who got me the gig on Buddy Rich's band and was my trombone instructor at Berkeley, brought in Mercy, 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 and uh, we, we rehearsed it that night. Eventually, a couple months later, recorded it, and it was, it almost won a Grammy. It was my first recorded album with Buddy Rich. I had the job, but I had to do the rehearsal. 
Uh, well, if I'd, have, if, if I'd have clammed, I wouldn't have had the job. <laughs> you know, <laughs> the next gig was at 10 o'clock in the morning on the Mike Douglas show in Philadelphia. And I had to sleep on the floor of one of the trumpet players' rooms and then get up and go into Philadelphia and sight read Wet the West Side Story medley uh, live on TV. introduced my parents to Buddy Rich or anybody thinking that that's what everybody does. Uh, I said I never even thought that they might want to meet Buddy Rich but I always thought well that's not what people do is it's kind of uh, uh, obsequious and uh, so I never did it and then when we did the Buddy Rich tribute in 85 and mom came out to see the see the band with but with Buddy's band, she, she went up to him after after his set and said, "She says I'm Rick's mother. Rick wants a T-shirt and there's no none left." And he took off his T-shirt and gave it to her. Right. <laughs> so I go into the bathroom and Lenny's on the turn, turnpike. I'm in there taking a leak, and the guy next to me, who was my grandfather, he walks in and starts taking a leak, and he says, "I bet you don't remember me, my grandfather." <laughs> So did he disown me or not? But he never showed any indication that he was proud of the fact that I was a featured player with Buddy Rich's band because he didn't like to see